Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you're able to make the session this morning. Um, thank you so much to the DRWF for the invite to speak about a topic that's really um, close to my heart, it's really important to me uh, personally, but I'm sure we're going to find out more about that um, as the session goes on. So today, I've been joined by a wonderful panel who are going to introduce themselves shortly. We're going to be talking about tackling diabetes inequity in UK black populations. And we're going to have some lived experience contributions. Um, what we're going to do today is um, find out who's in the audience, do a quick review of the inequity in diabetes that we are seeing in UK black populations. We're going to have a panel discussion and have some time for Q&A. So who's on the panel with me today? I think let's start at the bottom. Uh, Dan, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, um, morning everyone. My name's Daniel. I've uh, been living with type 1 diabetes for over 28 years, um, and I'm a diabetes advocate. Morning everyone. My name's Talika. I've been living with diabetes for almost four years now, and I'm a diabetes advocate. Morning everyone. My name's Amelia. Um, I've had type 1 for 26 years now and um, diabetes advocate. Morning, my name is Barbara Hudson. I'm a diabetes specialist nurse based in Birmingham and I've worked in diabetes now for about 28 years. And I'm Bernadette de la Catrax. I'm actually a pharmacist by profession, but I'm the executive director of Diabetes Africa. Uh, we're a non profit organisation and our whole mission is to reduce diabetes inequalities uh, for people of black heritage and we also have projects in Africa and starting in the Caribbean but um, obviously my focus at the moment is um, tackling inequalities in black populations related to diabetes in the UK. So quick show of hands, I recognise quite a few of the faces but um, I'm wondering who in the audience is a healthcare professional? A person living with diabetes? Uh, researchers or other? <laughs> Some um, covering both, which is brilliant. Right, so the reason I'm going to start with this slide is sometimes we um, get feedback that people don't believe there is inequity in diabetes outcomes for black populations in the UK. So I wanted to uh, make the case for three specific areas where we are seeing inequity, and that's access to diabetes technology. Um, being well prepared for pregnancy, I'll share what that is shortly, and also chronic kidney disease in people living with diabetes. So the first one is um, black children and young people in, in England or Wales have less access to diabetes technology. And as you can see from the graph on the bottom left, that's continuous glucose monitoring, and the next uh, bar chart is um, uh, insulin pumps. And the white bar is white children and young people, the orange bar is black children and young people. And you can see in both cases for CGM and PUM that black children and young people have less access. And the chart on the right hand side is showing the difference between black children and white uh, children. And over time, from 2020 to 2023, the gap between those two groups is actually getting wider. Um, we hope this will change, but it's just to illustrate the point. And often we're told, oh, that's because people of black heritage are often living in more deprived areas, they have a um, lower socioeconomic status. But what this graph is showing for CGM on the left bars and insulin pumps on the right, that even if you take the most deprived groups and compare them to black children and young people, which that the bars on the, uh, the orange bars will also include black children and young people with high socioeconomic status black children still have lower uptake and access. So this is a continuous problem that we're seeing even um, factoring in socioeconomic status. The next example is being well prepared for pregnancy. So well prepared for pregnancy means um, that the women are not on statins, they're not on ACE inhibitors, they're not taking any other medication which is contraindicated in pregnancy, and um, they're taking five milligrams uh, of folic acid, and also at 28 weeks that they're um, HbA1c is less than 48 millimole per mole. So basically, good control, ready for um, giving birth. And that has positive outcomes for mum and baby. So the graph is a little small, but what we can see here 
is this is Asian, Black, mixed, not stated other, and non and white. So we're comparing uh, white women in the last bar chart, and the second line is uh, Black women. We see that that criteria of well prepared for pregnancy, fewer Black women are well prepared for pregnancy, and we know that has poor outcomes for uh, mum and baby moving forward. And the final example I'm going to give is this is for at risk of renal replacement therapy, so things like uh, dialysis, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis. And um, the orange lines are black men and uh, white men and women with type 1 diabetes on the left and type 2 diabetes on the right. And the blue and gray lines are black men and women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And you can see both graphs that the, the risk of needing renal replacement therapy is significantly higher if you're of black ethnicity. So there's something, there are things that we need to do and there are examples of inequity that, um, that we're seeing. And so I wanted to, with that as the foundation, move into the panel discussion and I guess ask three questions of our people who lived the experience and also Barbara, um, diabetes specialist nurse. Um, in your view, what's the biggest cause of the inequities that we're seeing? It doesn't need to be from these examples, it can be from other areas. Um, how does that link with your personal experiences? And what can be done to improve the situation? Um, I'm going to go in the same order again. Dan, can you kick us off, please? Do you want to start the first all three? As you wish. Um, can you just repeat? <laughs> <laughs> So, in your view, what's the biggest cause of the inequities we see? And it doesn't need to be these, it can be others. Um, so, for me, I think the biggest cause is having access to, or well, firstly, access to information and knowing what you're entitled to, and then getting what you're what you're entitled to. Um, so, I think for me, I'm I'm very fortunate. So. Um, I started working at a type 1 diabetes medical research charity in 2013 and when I was there that really opened my eyes to what's available, how to actually navigate the healthcare system and have the confidence to challenge healthcare professionals if I'm told no, it's okay to challenge and then how I do that and had I not been there I wouldn't have known that and I would have just been reliant upon my healthcare professional telling me what I can and what I can't have and not have the confidence to challenge or to find out what I'm entitled to. And I think that's one of the dynamics that takes place in the consultation particularly. And I think within the our, our community is that for me anyway, growing up, we was always thought you must respect the healthcare professional or the doctor and take what the doctor's saying is truth and don't challenge. And I think if you still have that belief and you go into those consultations then you just take what they're saying but you don't know that you can challenge and then get what you're entitled to so I think that's one of the reasons for for me and um, I would definitely second that I'd say it's the information that you're given the lack of access to different things so I I was diagnosed during the pandemic so I've had consultations where that's been used as, as an excuse as to why I've not been um, seen that much or why I've not been given certain information. Oh, it was during COVID, so that's why. <laughs> so, which a lot of the time throughout the last few years, it's just I've been left in a state of limbo. I don't know what's going on or I'm not too sure why, but I'm not able to challenge it because I don't have access to certain information. Um, I agree with all of them. It's sometimes you're not knowing and um, I'm quite stubborn. So, and if I've noticed someone else has got something and I'm like, why have I not been told about this? I will question it. But then it's always told, oh, because you're not looking after it, you can't have that. Or if you look after it, you may get it. If you do something for me to help you, instead of going, okay, let's just see how this works and if it's going to help then this is what we stick with but it's all about what you know when i was first diagnosed i knew nothing i didn't even know it existed so it was like starting fresh and as i've got older and had it for quite a time i'm still learning new things but 
now I know that I can go and research things before the arts can I have it. Barbara, from your clinical experiences, anything you want to add to what's been shared so far? Um, I think the first thing I would add really is that um, when sometimes people say you have to treat everybody the same, but I think that myth is, is, is not correct in, in, in my view. And it's about asking the right questions, building trust, and actually seeing what the person who's living with diabetes wants, see what their, their agenda is to begin with, and actually to um, find out what they actually know. And then once you build that relationship of trust, uh, and you can have this dialogue, then you can give them the information they need at the time that they actually need it. Um, and I, I just find that, you, you know, my first thing would be is, do you know why you've actually come to your consultation? The second thing would be is, what would you like the outcome to be and what can I help you with? So I literally use that as the foundation to move forward with that individual. And then with that, you can find out what they don't know and what they need to know and how you get there. And it's very much partnership. And I think that's kind of the best. And, th and that's changed. And I will echo um, what Dan Daniel said. He, he, he actually said, you know, um, you respect that healthcare professional that you come in. Because a lot of my parents are the same. They literally do as they are told. And when you actually offer somebody uh, the chance to make their own decisions, they'll go, I don't know you're the healthcare professional, I've come in to see you. And it's about changing that dialogue. And the only way you change that dialogue actually is to inform them or educate them about what needs to be done and then they can make an informed decision. And it, it's, it's literally, it can be a very slow process. You have to change people's perceptions or point of view the way they manage their care because it, it has changed in the period of time. It was, you do as I do, and, I, and it's, I'm sorry to say that, but that's how it was. This is what you've got, this is what you need to do. And I evolved my practice to go the other way and to find out what do you want and what we can do. And there's a difference, I think. Thanks, Barbara. And Dan, Barbara, you've mentioned a, a key point that I think might be worth discussing. Um, part of my upbringing, my, my heritage is Nigerian. Um, respect was a huge part of, um, I guess, the culture. And you had to respect your elders, your aunties and uncles. Um, for those who are not familiar, even if someone's not your blood relative, um, you often refer to them as auntie and uncle. So there's really this respect of elders and people in respective positions. And I wonder how that interacts. I mean, Dan, Dan's touched upon it, how that interacts in a consultation uh, where you might be hesitant to challenge an authority figure. And I think let's call the elephant in the room. There are biases of angry black women, angry black men, and trying to um, avoid any perceptions of fitting into that stereotype. So I don't know if anyone has, wants to comment on that further. Dan, go ahead. Um, so I think that when it comes to the respect, it's it's definitely, well, for me, it was there. And then I kind of, not, I wouldn't say I lost it, obviously the respect is there in the consultation, but my mindset shifted to this is, almost you're there for me what can I need to get the best out of this appointment or what do I need to get out of this appointment rather than thinking oh I just need to go and you're the one who's going to give me all of my solutions what am I going to get and then there's flipping flipping that but it is it's not it's easier said than done um and then when it comes to um the kind of the stereotypes I think I think I'm I'm consciously subconsciously aware of if I speak a certain way, then it's easy to be labelled as angry. And even when you are, when you've been treated unfairly, you can't express it a certain way, because then if you do express it that way, then if that label's then thrown back at you, then you're now given a marker, which can then affect you getting any help or support that you might further need, whether we want to admit it or 
believe it happens or it doesn't happen. It does happen and it can happen. And that's always in the back of your, your mind of, okay, I need something, how do I navigate this? But even though something has been, I've been treated un, un, unfairly. Um, and, that's, and that's hard. And again, when, when it goes back to people asking for help, if you don't have the confidence to do that and you just get told that and you don't want to fight, and maybe you're just tired of fighting because there's a lot of fight that goes on outside of healthcare. Why are you then going to do that? And then say, like, oh, I don't want it. But you need it, and we all need the technology to help us because then our, 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 our health is affected. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to go for. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tamika and Amelia, anything to add to that? Oh. Um, I agree with what Daniel says. I kind of go in going, okay, am I doing the right thing? And there's been times where I've been told I'm not doing the right thing. And I have to stop myself from saying what I really want to say, and I just sit there and shut down and I go, well, you've not helped me to find that solution. You've just told me I've done the wrong thing. And that's that. And then I think as well, I'm quite forward with it when I'm when I'm sitting there, because I got I get that you're the healthcare profession, but it's a lot harder to live with if you don't experience it yourself. So as much as they're all going, yeah, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Actually, sometimes when you are doing what you're supposed to do, it's a lot harder. And they don't tend to see the struggle of you struggling with it. All they're looking at is that the data is not where it should be. Okay, I think there's another thing is um, the c cultural perceptions of health, and I don't know whether there has been any in-depth or a lot of research into that. Is uh, literally, I guess you have to have a, an interest in it. But I did speak to somebody the other day, and um, they were saying that their friends, that use when we're talking about the use of technology here and it was why would you want to wear something that will highlight your condition and it, it makes you look sick yeah and, and and what is diabetes anyway so that does go down to um that does go down to diabetes as well and um different cultural beliefs around health um and dan you were saying something weren't you about um how people perceive you with having diabetes. Do you want to sort of elaborate on that within was, the culture? Yes. Yeah. Like this morning. Yeah, that was this morning. <laughs> um, was that talking? I can't remember. Was that us saying the last three Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so that's what I was saying. So when I was, I was given the example of the three of us speaking, sitting here in front of you today, talking about our experiences. We've had to overcome cultural, um, certain cultural beliefs around health to what we've spoken about. At one point, the three of us were thinking that way, but we've had to overcome those challenges of breaking free of what is kind of shared as almost like cultural norms when it comes to health, to actually realise actually, you know, we're not going to follow that path, we're going down a different path, and we're going to make sure that we're doing the best that we can for our health. But going against the flow of your culture, particularly in black communities, is is hard. Um, but we've had to overcome that to be here today. And I think that's another challenge that, that people living with diabetes or living with chronic illnesses face is that because the wider culture around you doesn't talk about health, and you're that one person, you you have to make that change. It's, e it's not as easy as people might think. But for us, as I said, for us to be here today, we've done it. And it's been a challenge. And it will always be a challenge because we'll always have comments from family members and just quite the culture. But that comes into play as well when it comes to getting help at the health school that you need. Thank you, Dan. Um, and a point I wanted to touch upon because you said cultural perceptions of health. Um, my, my heritage is Nigerian. Uh, my parents are very religious and some of the phrases that I heard 
grow up. My whole childhood is, I reject it, it's not my portion, and God will do it. And I think those themes, I think, amen. <laughs> amen to that. But I think those are quite um, pervasive and can sometimes come ahead of what we could call conventional medication. So I think, um, Barbara and Danny mentioned that our relationship with a healthcare professional to be able to talk these things out um, for the reasons why someone might say no to something to come forward to actually have that discussion. Um, I always feel that there's three pillars. It's the relationship of the healthcare professional with the person living with diabetes and their family, how problem solving, proactive, um, positive the healthcare professional is, and then also how much time they actually have to spend with the person living with diabetes, because I think without those three pillars, uh, we're not going to make, we're going to struggle to make progress, I think. Go ahead, Barbara. And, and the other thing I, yeah. The other thing um, I also noted, um, and obviously I work within diabetes and, and have done for many years, is that at some point I didn't realise, and, and I don't think we have the numbers, and I wish we did, um, to identify how many people of uh, black heritage actually have type 1 diabetes or different variations or variants of, of that. Um, and, and, and how many have uh, there's several there's lots of subtypes of type 2 diabetes and and also the realization that some treatments potentially won't work especially with type 2 diabetes and then also looking at the adherence um, so a, a very simple analogy is that ACE inhibitors don't work for people with in, in African Caribbean population. So there may be medications out there that we're giving people that don't necessarily work as well. And also the diagnostic criteria may be very different and the onset of different complications as well and different phenotypes. And I don't feel that there is enough research out there for us to, to, to we, we need to be looking at that. And, and that leads me to the other point of, um, do we actually have enough people from those ethnicities that enter into studies so that we can then see the difference and decide on the treatments? Because when I try to enrol people into studies, they're very distrustful. Um, they want to know what people are going to do with their blood, what people are going to do with their data, etc. So I kind of think there's a lot of work to be done and just simple things like looking at the inequities of using tech. I, I think it, tech is amazing and if I had the money I would give it to everybody but you know what, not everybody wants it and we probably need to be looking at the reasons why and the barriers behind why people don't want to uptake treatment that potentially can change change their lives and the quality of life. Yeah, and I think when you say um, people don't want it, you fold that on with a great point that to, let's actually find out why. Because yeah. some of the reasons might be they don't have a good relationship with their healthcare professional, so they just don't want to have any more engagement. It could be it could be a multitude of reasons. And um, I would I would not like people to leave here today to say the thinking that, you know, maybe black people don't want the technology. I think it, it's a great advancement and it changes people's lives. So um, I think we, we should. All right. So I'm wary of time. Time's going. So if I can go, um, I'll go the opposite way. If you could say one thing that could be changed, that can tackle inequality or inequity that we see, what would it be? Um, for me, it's more of the stereotyping and thinking that if you say no, that I'm gonna get angry about it. As long as you explain it, I'll be like, okay, I'll try something else. For me, I'd stick with the access to information, or more so the education behind it, because for myself, I don't feel like I know much more than the day I was diagnosed about this disease that I'm living with, as well as the people around me as well as that relationship with healthcare professionals that we spoke about, like 
I, it's only now I'm starting to sort of advocate for myself and speak up for myself and question, well, why is this? Or what are the options? A lot of the time, the options are not given. It's just, you're given this option, that's it. And I've had times where it's like, I said, this doesn't agree with me, this makes me feel unwell. And my healthcare professional was telling me, oh, that doesn't make sense. But, but that's my experience. So I think if I had that information to say, well, actually, this is another option. And like Barbara said, there's lots of different subtypes and things like that. I, I wasn't aware of that. So from the day I was diagnosed, I wasn't given a clear diagnosis. And if I had known that that's a, a regular thing or that there's other types out there that are not just flat out type one, type two, then that would help me have a peace of mind and a better control of my diabetes. So it's just educating as many people as possible, I would say. Um, and for me, I think it's kind of been a theme, what we said is around just building that trust um, and seeing the person living with diabetes, not just as a particularly type one, just a data churning machine, but as a person who is Daniel living with type 1 diabetes rather than type 1 diabetes is living with Daniel. And I think that's that's a key thing for me is to trust, access to information, and then probably going back to Barbara's point, what outside of that is around research and having more research in, in the area um, <coughs> and enabling us to have that data that can then hopefully drive and lead, lead to change. Thank you, Dan. I just want to touch upon one thing before we move on to the questions, um, because you mentioned, um, Tamika, about um, access to information. So my dad is living with type 2 diabetes, and uh, we were living in Scotland at the time when he was diagnosed. And when he came home with the information leaflet about how he could change his lifestyle to improve his outcomes, it was a slide with like pasta, um, salads, and stuff. My dad is a Nigerian man. <laughs> He's like, where's my jollof rice? Where's my awa? Where's my... So it just, the information he received was completely, it didn't resonate with him at all. Um, my mum does most of the cooking, so the, all the uh, consultation went to my dad, not my mum. It's all these things that we take for granted, um, that culture of humility, um, of understanding some of the things that might be common in people of certain backgrounds that can make all the difference. Um, I know things are getting better. Prof Goff is um, speaking afterwards about um, a culturally tailored program for people of um, African and African Caribbean heritage. But I think there are many, many ways we can make um, a difference um, to people. And, and I like the, the points that everyone's chosen. Um, we have some time. So any questions or any questions, any comments? I'm going to pick on you because I know you're a PhD student, um, Immaculate. So I'm wondering if you want to say briefly what you're working on and in how, how it does it resonate with anything that we've spoken about today. Thank you very much. Well, I've actually um, got some slides from Immaculate, which I'm going to be presenting in the next session in the room okay. next door. So if anyone wants to come and hear that, you're very welcome. Um, but yes, I've got a PhD student called Immaculate. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today because it's her birthday. Oh, happy <laughs> birthday! <laughs> but um, she's do her whole PhD is about improving self-management of type 2 diabetes in patients of uh, Black and African heritage in the UK. And she's been working on a systematic review of um, qualitative studies. And yes, a lot of what you've said uh, resonates. Um, a lot of the studies talk about the cultural importance of traditional foods and how people see that as part of their identity. And as you said, a lot of the information that the NHS provides just doesn't take that into account. Um, as you also mentioned, you know, there's the, the gender roles maybe more so than in, other, um, uh, than in other cultures about men generally don't cook. And so, you know, they, especially men living on their own, are not very good at, you know, adapting how they're preparing food and so on. And then the, the thing that really surprised me was the um, issue of stigma and how people don't like talking about uh, diabetes, they don't like telling other people they've got diabetes. 
Um, and when you combine that with um, you know, social events where there's lots of food, quite a lot of carbohydrate rich foods and people don't feel able to say well, I'm diabetic, um, then that, uh, that becomes a challenge as well. So yes, absolutely it resonates with, with everything that you've said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and forgive me for putting you on the spot. But I'm going to do it again, Mira. I know you've done. <laughs> I know you've done so much work um, in this area, especially uh, related to technology. Do you want to say a little bit about? It? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you. So um, I'm Mira Lado. I'm a doctor in London, and um, where I work, we look after a lot of um, Black people with type one and type two diabetes. Um, and I've also been involved um, quite a lot in recruiting black people to diabetes studies. So everything you're saying is my bread and butter, really. It's really um, part of my life. And um, I really became much more interested in it. I remember it very vividly when I was looking after um, a patient on the hemodialysis unit and I stepped onto the unit and I had, I think, a whole row that were all my patients that all had diabetes on dialysis and they were all black. And I looked at that and I thought, what's going on here? This isn't right. I'm seeing too many lives ruined, you know, by this, by this condition. So um, we have, uh, where we are, done a great deal of community outreach work. Um, I think one of the things has been that we can't sit in our hospital and expect people to always be coming to us we need to go out there a little bit more um, and our rates of um, technology uptake in young black and black people have um, increased tremendously with that work and i suppose that's what it all boils down to is the word that i think was mentioned quite a few times by everyone which was trust um, because i think that the default for a lot of people is not to really be, be quite wary and not have full trust in what I'm telling them to begin with, because I'm not part of that community. And because, you know, for very good historical reasons, the history of what's happened to black people in medical research is a very, very horrific history. Um, so it has actually taken time to build that trust and for people to understand because how can we move forward at all if you as a person don't feel that what I'm trying to tell you or offering you is actually truly what's in your best interest? Healthcare completely relies on trust. It completely relies on you saying, okay, you know, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to believe that what you're telling me is, is you know, uh, is honestly the best thing for me and that you're going to try and do your best to keep me safe and to keep me well. Without that, there's nothing. Thank you, Mira. Really well said. Um, I realise this is a panel discussion and I'm up and down, but Swati from Kidney Research UK. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> uh, Bernadette. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, so my name's Swati. I work at Kidney Research UK. You know, some of you guys and everything that you, you've said today in this panel has resonated, especially around the uh, health inequities within research. And Mira, you've absolutely nailed the, the point that not a lot of people want to talk about is the historical and cultural context of research um, and how it was misused. Um, and unless we address that, I think we have a huge issue of moving forwards with bringing that trust and helping to break down some of those barriers. My question was to Barbara around what your thoughts are with that dynamic of the cloak of authority that healthcare professionals have in this dynamic. What, what do you think the role of patient reported outcomes are in terms of driving that conversation and allowing the patient to be the one that leads it? There are loads of outcomes and, you know, problems. Do you, what, what are your thoughts on them actually being utilised to give a voice to patients to advocate how that conversation and that treatment session goes? Um, I guess, I, well, the first thing that's really important, um, because it's not about our agenda, and there are many, I think, many consultations that I've had which haven't trust, uh, touched the treatment options 
for that particular individual for that first kind of communication because you've got to set the scene <coughs> there are certain tick boxes that you have to have to get but does it really mean it has to be at that first intervention mm -hmm. so it's just, it, you can use it as a, a baseline but it's really important that you identify what their agenda is at the very and beginning what they want, and what they want mm -hmm. so that i think you, that's how you need to set the scene because that can actually make a difference to your future um, relationship and actually you find that you move forward a lot quicker by doing that. I don't know whether that answered your question. No, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess the challenge is, like you said, that it doesn't become tick box yeah, exactly. of like the patient's done the proms, um, yeah. the voice the voice projects, um, <laughs> yeah. that they've done the proms but yeah. it just gets put to one side because yeah, I've got you, to look at your HBA one yeah, and all your yeah. bloods and so, so everything you're aware else. of all of that anyway yeah. and, and you are discussing the importance but I think it's as as they all said it's why are you asking me those questions you need to actually say this is why we do x y and z and and um, this is why we would like it to be better where would you what would be your first goal and you know that perhaps in time we're going to move that down because we're actually doing that for a reason yeah and, and usually they don't know the reason behind it first or they or you actually use it as done with saying they use it as a as they weaponize that information against you. Mm. If you don't get this, you're going to get that. Yeah. And let's just stop using that, let's turn that around right. to inform them first. Before we go to an, another question Sorry. or a comment from the audience, um, Dan, Tawika, Amelia, do you want to comment on that interesting discussion about you know how the relationship is framed by the healthcare professional? Tawika, do you want to go? Yeah. Um, in my experience, it definitely does. Like I've had appointments, consultations where I've left feeling absolutely deflated, and I've also had ones where I felt better. I felt like, okay, I've come here. This has helped. Um, personally, having Barbara <laughs> as a healthcare professional is amazing. I feel as though she treats me like a person. She speaks to me like a person. She'll ask me my experience how it relates, she'll tell me what I need to do, what what to plan to do, but then she will relate it to my actual life, whereas I've had appointments where it's just like, this is what you need to do, um, keep taking your medication, do this, 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 and I'm like, but it's not working. Mm. Yeah, well, you just need to do that. And yeah. that makes a massive difference to how you move forward. Um, yeah, my current situation, I feel as though I was basically traumatised and that's by a healthcare professional. So it's just not having that trust to this day, that's, it's put me off a lot. It's changed my perspective of, okay, I can't trust everyone. I need to know why I'm doing this. I need to know what I'm putting in my body. And as well as what you have mentioned, that cultural element, it makes a big difference because I was raised in a Caribbean religious household, so you have that respect your elders, respect your professionals, you have that own, um, we don't do medication and all of that. So it's hard finding that balance of, well, I don't want to put this stuff in my body, but it's, it's helping me survive. So when you've got somebody there that's explaining to you, well, this is going to help you with this, or this is what this is, um, I know you might not want to, but it will help that makes a massive difference. That's That's been my lived experience. So having having someone there that you can trust and that will explain things to you as you, not as a number or data, that makes, yeah, that make, makes it more bearable. We'll go to Dan and then... It's um, just a really kind of quick point. And so earlier, and I, and I think that perhaps when it comes to the diabetes area of healthcare, there's opportunity to learn, from my experience, opportunity to learn from other areas. So early this year, I had a family bereavement, lost somebody really close to me. Um, I had a shared, so I had a kidney transplant in 2018. Um, and when I had my first consultation with my diabetes consultant after the family bereavement, uh, I was told that I wasn't doing well when it came to my levels and my management. Um, and then further on into consultation, 
they Martha Salter read the letter from my kidney team and it said Daniel has experienced a family bereavement. And at that point, the whole conversation changed and there was an understanding of, oh, he's gone through something. And what, why I say that is in comparison to my kidney team, when I met them and I told them that I'd gone through this family bereavement, their response was, how can we help you? How can we, how can we support you? We know that I said that I haven't been taking my medication as I should, that how can we help you? How can we support you? And that example of my kidney team, they had built the trust over a number of months, a number of years, and they've not just seen me as a number, they've seen me as a, a person. And I think that that's where diabetes, the diabetes, part, some, not all, but some teams can learn from other departments of just actually just seeing you as a person. Um, and sometimes I think when the word diabetes comes into play, people automatically think data, number, HbA1c needs to be there. H and an example, it's just when I've had appointments with ophthalmologists that they've asked me what my HbA1c is and told me, somebody said, oh, that will tell me everything I need to know. Mm -hmm. And little comments like that, it doesn't at all. Um, so yeah, it's really an opportunity to learn from others. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Talika. And I think it's, um, it's important that, uh, we had a conversation yesterday about the comment, um, I don't see color and what people's intention is when they say that you could say is positive they're trying to say maybe they're trying to say in some cases i see that you are of a different ethnicity to me and that doesn't matter to me i still you know i still value you but it can also mean i completely disregard any experience that you have as a result of your ethnicity or looking different and i think that um, as a black person, I say I, I can say I, I'm going to generalize. I'm going to say as a black person, in every interaction, especially in the UK, when you're minority ethnic population in a country, in every interaction you have to think is how much of this is because I'm black, and I think that that's a burden to carry. Um, I'm not living with diabetes, but imagine living with a long-term chronic condition. M many people living with many carrying that into every interaction, into every discussion, into everything is a, is a lot. But I'd like to, to go to the audience again. I know if you bear me some extra time, because I know we've, we've got the break, um, okay. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me this uh, opportunity to talk. Sorry I came in late. Uh, I want to acknowledge the speakers. They've done very well because everything they've said is actually what is happening in our community. But my worry here is about the emotional well-being of these people living with diabetes because uh, uh, we have a charity in Wolverhampton called the Global Diabetes Initiative and we support a lot of people from the ethnic minority and emotional well-being is a big issue and the GPs are causing some of these issues because there are so many things they tell them they go back home they get so worried about everything that they've been told if you if i come and i have diabetes and you are my gp you say go and eat healthy what is the definition for an african person who has never been to school to understand what is eating healthy you've already given them that mental talk to go and stay home and start thinking what to do so education education is the key let us look at the emotional way because our people are suffering and we have to go out there and educate them uh, another point i just want to highlight i came in here and unfortunately a lot of people within our community i'm not sure if they know about this or they didn't just want to come look at there are lots of information here to live for our community and they are not here and I will want to say that you coordinating this panel take that to the team so that next time they could invite quite a lot of people that are affected by this or reach out to other organizations that they are helping people with diabetes so we can arrange and bring some of them here thank you let's let's work to, let's work together let's partner um, we Come to see me at the stand later, and we can we yes. can discuss further. But um, I think thank you for your contribution, for everyone's contributions. Um, a wonderful session. We could go on, but I know we're we're getting signals at the back that we need to round up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, Tilenka, Amelia, Barbara. Uh, thank you everyone in the audience. Thank you DRWF for the invitation to come speak about this topic. Um, 
you can come and see us at the stand and um, contact us on our socials if you want to continue the conversation. But thank you so much. <laughs>